the National Institute of Technology, University of Technology Malaysia, UTM, Kuala Lumpur. He received a PhD from Old Track University, Faculty of Geoscience, the Netherlands, United Nations University, UNU Disaster Risk Management Center for Special, sorry, with cooperation of Faculty of Geoinformation Science and Third Observation, University of Twente, United Nations University, UNU Disaster Risk Management Center for Special Analysis and Risk Management. He is one of the science and technology expert panels for DRR, the National Disaster Management Agency, NACMA, Technical Committee for Interagency for Slope Management, and many national committees. He is actively engaged in various societies, including European Geoscience Union and IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society. He has garnered international recognition, including being named a top 11 Young World Geomorphologist and receiving Merdeka Award grant. His contribution extends to disaster risk reduction programs, earning him a membership in the IRDR Young Scientist Program and, in, and recognition as 2021 Outstanding ASEAN Science Diplomat. Without further ado, I will I welcome Dr. Kamarul Azari Raza. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Farouk, um, for the introductions. Mr. Chigira, can you hear us once again? Yes, I can. Perfect, perfect. We are still waiting one more panelist from Wanda, uh, Professor Digini. While, um, while waiting, perhaps we can kick off our session. So, Three more minutes to go uh, for the official uh, sessions. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and a uh, very good uh, day, everyone. Welcome to the special sessions. Um, and uh, for this particular point, I will be your moderator for today. It's uh, my great pleasure to be here uh, to support the session. And uh, perhaps uh, before we begin, um, let's give a big time to our uh, organizing committee. Let's join me. Give a big hand out in two days. Um, and uh, I think last night was so memorable. Mm -hmm. The dinner is not just about the foods, but also about the dancing and that's far away. Yeah? So Mr. President, um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rashid. And um, I think for this particular point, it was co-designed uh, to look into how basically we can support the, um, uh, well, perhaps first we have to understand about the past and second, how we can rejuvenate um, for the future. So for this particular session, we choose particularly the titles uh, Engineering Geology and Geotechnic for Disaster Risk Reduction and Community Resilience continent to continent discussions. So together with me today on screen online, live from Tokyo, Japan, uh, Professor Masahiro Chigira, thank you Chigira Sensei for joining us. And I'm not alone, um, I would like to invite two more uh, panelists, um, uh, Anne and Nadu Bekara, let's join me. Oh, lovely, please have a seat. Good, great. We have two more minutes, by the way. Um, we can start. Um, we have four segments today. Uh, two segments, the first two segments, uh, we would like to hear uh, views and opinions of our panelists. The last two segments, we would like to open to the floor. Um, not only those who are here physically, but also, uh, we are open to the our. We are open to our participants who are joining online. Um, so, uh, perhaps um, organizing committee will help me. Um, while the 
that'll be a series of uh, message, perhaps uh, questions on chat box. Uh, and also um, those who are in this hall for today. So we have one and a half hour session. I know it's going to be uh, lengthy, given the fact that it's already two years. I'm sorry, two days. This looks like a two years. One day, so it's, um, um, it's back to back from one room to another, one session to another. I know it's not easy, but believe me, this session is so critical uh, for the future. We have prepared 10 key recommendations uh, to be announced, to be shared uh, at, the, at the end of the session. So I think that's on time. One minute to go. Professor Digini. Good morning. Good afternoon from Kuala Lumpur. Good Morning from Kigali. Can you hear us? Morning. Morning. Perfect. Lovely. That's enough to uh, begin our sessions today. So, um, well, we got four panelists, and for this particular part, we have uh, divided into four segments. The first two segments is on the uh, retro perspective views. So, we would like to hear. Um, a best practice, a stories of the past, how much basically they learn from the past and uh, lesson unlearned lessons as well. Yeah. So there are many uh, a story from the field, I believe. Um, and then the second part of the uh, panel discussions, we are addressing about the future, um, understanding about the demand uh, in the future, uh, particularly on the prospective agenda, charting the future novel technologies, innovation, and transmissionary approach. So I think let's have these two uh, sessions uh, set by um, by our panelists. It will perhaps uh, give us some clues on how we can move forward to the second part of the session. Um, well, that's about the sessions today. Is feel free if you have any questions, any remarks, recommendations. Feel free. Continents to continents means here we have on my right, uh, Dr. Zakaria is uh, from Malaysia. On my left, and William from uh, New Zealand. Perhaps uh, she will be representing the red groups, and we have Professor Chigira uh, from. Japan, and we have also Professor Digini from Rwanda. So perhaps uh, she uh, he be representing those who are living in these uh, African continents. So to set a scene for today, um, I think that's enough to uh, hear about the engineering geology for the last two days. Um, to hear uh, some of the best practice on the geology. Um, geotechnical engineering uh, aspect. But I think what we learned from the last two days and how much this information, knowledge, and, and, and also uh, solutions that we gain, perhaps to reduce the future risks, to prevent the impact of the future climate uh, change. And for that particular point, um, I would like to uh, also inform uh, then the uh, panelists will also address uh, a few uh, questions at the end of the uh, session. And uh, I'm, uh, for, for this particular part, I'm happy to welcome uh, not only those who are in the practitioner world, but also those who are in the uh, research world. I think, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think there are many colleagues here uh, from the academic world. Uh, feel free uh, to express your concern. Uh, some gaps between the practitioner world and the academic world, research world, and uh, we have to come to the conclusions today. So, ten key recommendations have been met. Ten key. So, depending on our session for one and a half hours, if we can add some more. So, I hope that we still have time at the end of the session to hear a story uh, from our vice president, from our colleague here who are attending the session. 
So to begin with, I think on my right, uh, Dr. Zakaria, if you can introduce yourself, one or two minutes about yourself, and also uh, and people didn't know you, I hope. But something interesting to inform today, we are live streaming for those who are you know, flying from Rwanda, uh, from um, uh, Africa, uh, and we are not just invited uh, Professor Digni, uh, we are also extended these invitations to the ministry in charge of uh, emergency management in Rwanda. So there will be uh, groups of disaster managers, policy makers from Africa, from Rwanda in particular, who will be joining us as well. Yeah? So please keep in mind that there will be a, a series of um, questions and also concerns from the audience yeah, online. So Dr. Zakaria, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Komaru, and uh, Bismillah Rahman. Assalamualaikum, very good morning, very good afternoon, and very good morning, our Dr. Agnes in Rwanda. Um, um, my name is Zakaria Muhammad, uh, I'm a geologist uh, by profession. Uh, currently, I'm president uh, as National Association, uh, National Association. Uh, for uh, geo disaster and uh, community resilience, these are NGOs, and also an adjunct professor at the BBC and UDN. And before that, I worked with the Department of Medical Science. Uh, at that time, I have, I have an opportunity to carry out this uh, assessment using uh, technology at that particular time. That's all for me. Thank you. Uh, um, I, uh, my name is Anne Williams. I am a practitioner. I have been a practitioner all of my career um, and have been involved in um, responding to a number of these climate challenges um, over the years, in particular um, to national uh, states of emergency um, declared in 2010-11 uh, and uh, again uh, just this last year in 2023. Good, thank you, Anne. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zakaria. So let's move to our panelists on screens. Uh, Professor Chingira, if you don't mind, you go first. Okay, terima kasih, Professor Kam Kamaruru. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I must apologize. I cannot join you on site, but uh, I'm very honored to be here online as a panelist. Uh, I'm a geologist and uh, I used to be working for Disaster Prevention Research Institute, Kyoto University, Japan. And uh, uh, several years ago, I retired and now working in a small research institute in Tokyo, Fukada Geological Institute. Uh, I was uh, once uh, uh, president of a uh, Japan, uh, so, uh, Japanese Society of uh, Engine Geology. Uh, okay, that's it. Thank you, Professor Chigira. Uh, we are happy to welcome you virtually indeed. Uh, Professor Digni, if you can hear us, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I'm very also happy to meet you in the virtually. I will be happy next time to meet you physically, either in Rwanda or in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, my name is Professor Dean Irgwabuhungu. I'm a geologist. Uh, I'm uh, the Dean and founder of the School of Mining and Geology at the University of Rwanda. At the continental level, I chair a team of 14 uh, high learning institutions under the project Tuning Africa to design a, an applied geology program that addressed at the same time geology, environmental and uh, geotechnics issues that uh, my my profile and i will be very pleased to exchange with colleague this meeting thank you thank you professor digni uh, once again um we would like to welcome uh, all the participants who are just joining us online from rwanda um, from japan thank you very much for joining us and also from malaysia uh Chirashi. 
uh, we make it this session open to all. Yeah, so perhaps some of you have failed, but for this particular part, we are open up sessions for those who are perhaps can't join us in the last two days. Good. I think let's start um, running the ball. I I think uh, we we have a long list of questions, and they do prepare. Uh, slides, so, but don't bother with the slides. Eh? Basically, they are not giving any presentation. Just give you some a clue of the point uh, of the discussions today. Um, so, for the first round um, discussion, uh, series number one, uh, we are uh, interested to hear uh, a story of the past, reflecting of the past experience and best practice related to engineering geology and geotechnic. But for this particular part, we would like to link up a link with the disaster risk reductions and disaster resilience. So these two parts, and uh, we have a keynote lecture by Anne uh, from Risk to Resilience. I think she set a, a good scenes of today's sessions. We are not just interested on the geological hazards, assessing vulnerability and hazards, perhaps understanding their current and future risks, but how basically we can accept a certain risk and build the societal resilience. Just to set the scene, um, it's a report released by the United Nations Office for Disaster Resistations. In Asia Pacific, we lost a people in every 30 minutes due to the natural disaster. So for this particular point, I just put uh, statements from the United Nations Office for Disaster Reductions based on the two decades uh, reports on the title of the human cause of disaster. The overview of the last 20 years, 2000-2019. Three points. The first part, there are um, significant shifts and increments of the numbers of the disaster in the past. And we are talking about 4.2 billion affected people and resulting in approximate USD 2.97 trillion in the global economic losses, number one. Number two, in Asia, we are talking about the highest number of disaster even recorded and reported. In fact, eight of the 10 top 10 countries in the world um, affected by the disaster event are located in Asia. So uh, these two, um, well, coming from Asia, Asia Pacific, um, Asia regions, we would like also to learn from Africa and why Rwanda, why Professor Digini today? Uh, I think I, I give you a little uh, background. I was, I was involved in, in the international project and dispatched as an international experts. Uh, uh, to the project funded by um, uh, a German uh, development fund. So what we are interested in, 40% um, of land in Rwanda are basically susceptible to uh, landslides and slope failures. So we learned a lot from the past, and I hope that Professor Digini can also share with us some of the clue on how basically we can improve and use some of the local knowledge, scientific knowledge, coupled with the technology and, and improve our understanding to the future earth surface and processes. Let's go to the first questions then. Um, lesson from the past, uh, Dato. Uh, and I think uh, Dato, uh, with your intensive um, and extensive experience in um, during geology as a former chairman of the board of geology i think um, you are in the right positions today to comment and give us some insight about the uh, experience of the past how basically um, a series of landslides and slope failures or even the, the sediment induced and uh, uh, debris flow in particular. How you learn from the part of this is a tragedy and, and what would be your uh, command, uh, the importance of learning from the past uh, to inform the future strategies that of just to uh, roll the ball, please. 
Thank you. Uh, first thing is uh, when we're talking about the development of uh, Indonesian geology in Malaysia itself, uh, we are very lucky because uh, in Malaysia we have uh, several uh, initiatives by the government and the justice uh, related to uh, road development. Actually, we, we, we developed the uh, engineering geology uh, first early 1975 when we have a Eastbed Highway. Uh, which uh, we indeed uh, road construction, and from there uh, we learned uh, uh, what uh, was wrong uh, about the geology or that side, perform the, the material and so on, a lot of testing and so on. And that activity is continuing. Right? Uh, and then secondly, especially uh, last ten years uh, since uh, 2015. Uh, Squid uh, in uh, Mount Nabalu uh, we got uh, uh, massive uh, rock fall and they were close. Uh, and that uh, opened up to the shipmaker to invest in more uh, research, more study, uh, including uh, uh, road network in Malaysia. And also a uh, special study as a risk assessment in municipal area carried uh, out by the GMG and also by the public wood department. At the same time, uh, we experienced uh, the uh, uh, WPO landslide. And in fact, uh, 2017, the uh, Penang was hit by the multiply uh, due to uh, Typhoon Dazuki just at the tail. They also uh, triggered the policy makers and government to get it. Look at the closely uh, about the issue of uh, landslide, uh, flood, and so on. Uh, because of that, uh, I also noticed that uh, it was not only uh, the world and also uh, energy energy sectors uh, like GMB and uh, you know, uh, them have to look at the safety. So they engage in geology and the technical engineering to, to investigate. From that, the development of uh, engine geology is. Uh, and also them, you know, the recently uh, uh, major landslide effect them. From that, uh, uh, very extensive study we've done. Uh, I think our geologists here uh, and engineers uh, learn a lot from that uh, studies. Yeah, we have a lot of information. Uh, that is what we, 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 we I think that the consequence of the events, a government invest in uh, the, the disaster risk reduction. So um, in terms of overall picture, government also, uh, Malaysian government also uh, also follow the center center frameworks, which is uh, uh, the, the four priority action. First one is uh, of course understanding your risk. That's where is uh, royal and the geology is there. And the second is risk governance related to uh, guideline and uh, and so on. And investing in mitigation, uh, structure and non structure. And that's why I want to, uh, to talk to about non structures and mitigation. And of course, preparedness, uh, respond, and uh, do better, better. Those are the areas of kind of priority in Malaysia. And there's opportunity for development of uh, engineering geology and for construction industry and, and development of uh, what we call resilient and critical infrastructure as well, like community uh, residents. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Zakaria. It's our great pleasure to have. Uh, Zakaria today. Um, I, I believe there are some participants here who are also uh, working under the supervision of Dr. Zakaria in the last 35 years. Yeah, so uh, welcome uh, everyone. So today is your session. Uh, uh, feel free if you have any particular sessions, uh, questions, remarks, uh, feel free uh, to highlight. So let's move quickly to my lab. Well, it's written here the questions, but I think I would like to quote here. What are the most significant lessons learned from past experience in engineering geology, geotending, and disaster resilience? How can we apply them to current and future challenges? That's what was written in the moderation notes in the free end. Right. Um, in order to respond to that, I kind of need to describe to you uh, some of the events that we have had in New Zealand over the last 13 years. Um, in 2010, uh, some of you may recall, it was the first day of the IAG Congress in Auckland, New Zealand, and uh, there was a significant 7.1 magnitude earthquake in Canterbury. 
Um, fortunately, no one died in that first event, um, but there were, was quite a lot of liquefaction and um, uh, rupture and so forth, so quite a bit of disruption. Um, following that event, uh, there were four more significant um, earthquakes, uh, which are part of this Canterbury earthquake sequence. They occurred in 2011 in February, June, um, I think October and December. But the February one was most significant, it caused significant damage in the city centre, um, and we lost 185 people. Uh, so just up, I'll pop back. Um, so for me, the Canterbury earthquake was well, a series of earthquakes were characterised by um, liquefaction, which you can see in the top uh, right hand um, corner. So uh, the city was covered in silt, um, a significant depth of silt. So liquefaction uh, became a household word, although the media uh, described liquefaction as the silt that. Uh, was deposited rather than this. Um, rock fall in the hills. Um, there's a bowl there going through someone's house. Um, and uh, lateral spread. Um, and some of the significant things that we learned were around liquefaction. Liquefaction occurred at the same location again and again and again. So in each of those five significant events, events liquefaction occurred again, whereas we didn't have anticipated that um, after occurring once or twice, it would not uh, reoccur. Um, and lateral speed spread was uh, recorded uh, more than 100 metres back from uh, rivers, which is again uh, far exceeded what we had anticipated was possible. Um, one of the awesome things that came out of the Canterbury earthquake sequence, I suppose, was um, what we have now called the New Zealand Geotechnical Database. It was a Canterbury uh, Geotechnical Database. It was a database that we established where um, that's available to everybody. Um, so you contribute um, borehole data, CPT data, investigation data, groundwater level data. It's available free to everybody. Um, but you have to contribute as well uh, if you're going to upload. Uh, so now that, that process, that um, opportunity has been widened to all of New Zealand. Um, and so we, wherever we do investigations, uh, we upload them to this database and then they're accessible for the next investigation, which means that we're not redoing things that we used to do in the past. Um, this is also the Canterbury earthquakes. It's just, just um, quite um, revealing, I suppose. Some of the top photo is someone standing on the hills in the south, they're called the Port Hills, uh, looking at the CBD of uh, Christchurch when the earthquake occurred in February, and you can see the dust cloud that's uh, from uh, the disruption that occurred in the CBD. Um, and below, uh, two images from just a couple of weeks, a week and a bit ago, uh, 14th of February, um, where significant fires um, have occurred in the, in the Port Hills. So that's looking from the CBD back to the hills. Um, as a result of uh, normally hot temperatures, temperatures uh, in Canterbury that are similar to what we're experiencing here in Galatia. Um, so unheard of temperatures. So this is, this is climate change for us. Um, uh, We'll move on to Kaikoura. This is a second event that uh, this one occurred in 2016. Um, so the things that characterise Kaikoura for me, there was fault rupture. Uh, the insect photo shows landslide dam. There were hundreds of landslide dams. Uh, fortunately, not a lot of people living in this area. Um, however, there is our state highway right now, major route uh, connecting communities. Uh, and you can see there that's a significant landsliding. But what was particularly interesting was up uplifting of the sea floor by two to five metres in that area, substantial uh, uplift and something we hadn't seen before. I suppose something that was really um, unusual was movement on at least 13 faults at the same time. Uh, and this has resulted in changes to our seismic code. And that's the uplift. Now you can see the insect photo just on the beach um, uplift of, of what was the shore platform, um, significant fault rupture. And the finally, the final uh, national disaster occurred just last year. Um, and there's a few images there. I shared a number in my talk um, yesterday. 
the, the bottom right image doesn't look so exciting. Um, and But what's important about this one, and we'll talk about it in answer to some of the other questions later, um, you can see there's power pylons there. Uh, these power pylons take power to the north of New Zealand. Um, and uh, it was an early reconnaissance, and they noticed a uh, landslip on the side there and thought that we should check it out. Um, what we actually found is that that pylon in the middle uh, is sitting on a landslide block that was uh, had reactivated um, with such an incredible amount of rain, unprecedented rain, um, and we needed to uh, remove the, the um, power wires disestablish the, the pylon and move it um, to an adjacent ridge. Great, unbelievable. You made it three minutes, mm -hmm. five slides, and unbelievable. Um, well, thank you very much, Anne. I, I think you set the scene and tones, and I believe that there are also a few slides from Dr. Zakaria who was, who was there. It will pop up later in the next cycle. Don't, don't worry. We are talking about 21,000 recorded and reported uh, slope failures in Malaysia, more than 7,000 landslides. So there are many things to open, I believe, from our complexity of our uh, uh, tropical um, uh, issues on handling these uh, mass home. Let's fly to Tokyo. Um, Professor uh, Chigira. As a renowned scientist, um, uh, working uh, a lot on the mountain geohazards, I, I, I wish that uh, that today you can also uh, share with us uh, from the field, especially uh, as, as a field geologist uh, and involved in many investigations uh, over a large scale disaster in Japan. Uh, perhaps there are some uh, past practice, lesson learned, and lesson unlearned that you can share with the audience today. Over to you, Professor Chigira. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Kamarulu. Uh, I prepared a few slides, so can I share the slides? Yes, please, Sensei. Uh -oh. Can you see? Yes, but we oh. see the presenter notes. Um, that's fine. Uh, that's fine. Okay. Uh, say, uh, this. Uh, there are two topics, and the one first topic is. Uh, uh, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> this is first topic, and uh, this is continent to continent discussion. But uh, I'm not living in a continent, so I'd like to talk. From islands of active tectonics and heavy rain, <laughs> and a focus on landslides. Say lessons from the past. Uh, first of all, uh, we Japan Japanese islands ex have been experiencing many, say landslides induced by rainfalls and also uh, earthquakes, and uh, rain induced landslides are different according to rainfall intensity. So strong rain induces uh, shallow, but many landslides and debris flows. Uh, in contrast, a large amount of rain induces fewer, but much larger landslides like a rock, rock avalanches. Uh, that's one point we learned. And earthquake induced landslides, uh, they are strongly dependent on the geology, particularly uh, these uh, years in Japan, volcanic fall materials and carbonates are specifically fragile. Oh, carbonates are not in Japan, but uh, other countries. So let me uh, show some examples. This is strong rain induces shallow landslides. Uh, left is 2012 Japan, uh, right is Korea. Uh, these two slides. Uh, say one of the most devastating landslides, shallow landslides, but so many landslides induced by rainfalls. But uh, generally they're not so big and uh, rather small, so we can control by countermeasures and also we can say avoid them by land usage. 
uh, on the contrary, a large amounts of rain induces rock avalanches like this, uh, left in Japan, or right Taiwan. They are huge and extremely rapid and uh, pre uh, say commonly forms landslide dams and uh, it breeds flooding and debris flows uh, occurs. So because of these features, we cannot evacuate. So hard countermeasures are difficult. So prediction and preparedness are necessary. Uh, these are things uh, we learned. And uh, earthquake induced landslides are strongly controlled by geology uh, left uh, 2012 uh, Japan. Uh, sorry, this is not 2012, 2018 <laughs> occurred in Hokkaido. Uh, this is one of the most devastating landslide hazards induced by earthquakes, not only in Japan, but uh, all over the world, I think. And uh, this uh, example in China, 2008, uh, so many lands are induced by a Wenchuan earthquake in carbonate area. And that's because uh, this is a Batu cave in Malaysia. Uh, this, so many landslides are due to uh, the uh, properties of a carbonate uh, dissolution by uh, groundwater. Uh, these two are just an example and uh, many other types occurred, but uh, they are strongly dependent on the geological structures uh, as a landslide induced by Kaikoura landslide uh, introduced by Am. And, but earthquakes uh, cannot be predicted, so we need to always prepare for earthquakes, like uh, do not sleep on the ground floor. Our experience says uh, landslides hit the ground floor and the uh, second floor are uh, rather much safer. Uh, that's our experience uh, tells us. Okay, thank you. That's uh, just uh, some example. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Jinger. Um, it was amazing, remarkable uh, sessions. Uh, indeed, uh, well, I think you give us a different views uh, based on different uh, cases. Uh, from uh, Japan, Korea, China, Indonesia, uh, and, and Taiwan. Uh, thank you. I think this uh, well, first round at least set the scene on how complex of our our geology and how important this intermediate geology knowledge and information is to make a good decisions. I think Professor Chikira has uh, listed some of the clue uh, which part is time require specific uh, disaster risk reduction strategies. Um, let's fly to Kigali then. Um, uh, it's much more complex, I believe. Um, and Professor Digini, um, and I'm, I'm happy to give a quick one or two questions to the floor um, here uh, physically, if you have a quick burning questions to the point raised by or point presented by the panelists before we jump to the second uh, discussions, yeah? So over to you, Professor Digni. Thank you very much. Uh, I have prepared a few slides. I'm trying to share it. Do you see it? It's coming, yeah. Make it a slide show then, please, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, the challenge will be time slot, but I will do my best. Then um, this is my presentation. I already done it. What you can learn from the past. First of all, we know that Rwanda is a land country located in Central East Africa and favored to natural disease. And when we go in the past, we remember how intense and frequent landslide, flood, and earthquake treatments are. On 2nd to 3rd May last year, we lost 135 individuals, more than 5,000 houses, and other critical infrastructure were damaged, including a direct loss of over 300 million. This underscores a significant gap in existing geology and geotechnical study and the need to integrate our expertise into early warning system and the resilience practices. 
as you see the map of the earth africa is a continent with very high level of exposure and high level of exposure uh, in different natural geo hazards the vision for global implementation and innovative solution and technology for resilient disease of practice, we think that technology-driven innovation should be our ally and furthers the synergy of different expertise. There must be a unified approach where real-time geological data enhance the precision of early warning. We need intercontinental collaboration and standardize the best practice. For doing so, we need to educate our generation, young generation of scientists. In 2018, 14 academic institutions in Africa was sitting together to design and implement a degree program in applied geology. I lead that team, and we published this under the project Tuning Africa. We designed implement a degree program in applied geology under the collaboration of AU and African Union, and you publish the book you see in the screen. This is the foundation of how we will educate our future generation of geologists and mining engineers to focus particularly in this, what we call meta profile we elaborate. This meta profile is in education, we need to have some value to educate our future graduates. They must be able to do exploration geology, mining geology, but also geotechnics and environmental geology and regulation. And that is the core of their meta profile. Then other, other critical thinking and synthesis, leadership, quality management, socioeconomic impact, communication and professionalism come in that design of the applied geology program. It's currently running in the University of Rwanda, and we are on, on uh, this particular design program. I don't know why it stopped to run. Mm -hmm. OK. Then the next, what should we do? For continental, if we train professionally, which apply the geology, it's good, but we need to foster cross-continental partnership in engineering, geology, and geotechnics. That's why we are here today, to try to establish knowledge exchange platform, collaborative research initiative, joint education program and fostering shared resources for us that will solve all challenging if everyone must be the architect of the resilient future however nothing can be done without the contribution of the community community are not passive recipients they are active partners their local knowledge is a treasury trove. We need to leverage knowledge of geology and geotechnics to provide scientific insight into local hazards and tap into the invaluable local knowledge held by the community. As we geologists and geotechnics conduct assessment, community must contribute their traditional wisdom and early warning signs and local resilience strategy create a collaborative and a robust foundation for disaster proof preparedness. That's what we think, and I'm sure that will make a difference if we do so. I take the opportunity to warm, invite you all to visit Rwanda, and I thank you for your kind consideration and attention. Thank you, Professor Digini. Give a big hand to Professor Digini live from Kigali and the rest of the panelists. I think we will we just end the first cycles, yeah? Believe me, we still have more cycles, segments to complete today. Um,
well, to continue the session, so, well, uh, as I promise, if you have any burning questions or inputs, applications still needed uh, based on the first point of the discussions, discussion sessions from New Zealand, I was uh, visited a Christchurch couple of uh, years after the earthquakes. There's so much we can learn, in fact. And, and definitely, uh, if the organizer can open a slides for that area uh, while waiting for the questions from the audience, yeah, physically, if any, on 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 the point. Yeah, on, on, on online, uh, any uh, questions from the, no, okay. So, well, we missed these slides. I think just a couple of slides, if we can give a couple of minutes to Dato Zakaria to convey some of the message of the past, uh, learning from a few, uh, say, fatal landslides and debris flow. Uh, I think it's uh, worth to uh, say, please, Dato. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Yeah. And the slide shows here is the an example of the catastrophic debris flow happening in Malaysia in 2021 and 2020. There's many of these slides, just one example. You see the, the debris, and this is a consists of a, a big block of rock, uh, trees. Uh, one thing we learned is the uh, landslide can also occur in Forested area, in a dense uh, populated area. Uh, normally, general public thinks when you have a, a forested area, very dense, the probability of a, a landslide happening is not happening. But uh, based on the, this uh, August 2021, it, and also uh, uh, other places, uh, we found that uh, because of very extreme rainfall, it's up to 100 millimeters uh, for uh, two days can trigger a massive landslide, uh, numerous landslides, and also, also trigger the debris flow. But that's a change our our thinking. Uh, before that, we our mapping is only in urban area. Now we have to look at the upstream on the forest area as well. So that's what we learned. And uh, after that, uh, at that time we are lucky because. Uh, we used to, to use a technology uh, like that technology, a remote sensing technology, and we may be setting from the MG and also uh, mapping team. And this is uh, the first time after this event, a government uh, agency, uh, for, the, for instance, this case is JMG, uh, willing to share the information with the local communities. And under the program, we call it uh, local, localization of the knowledge, body of knowledge based on experience from, let's say, Japan, Taiwan, and then we, 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 we together with the uh, local community, affected community, and also responder. And this maker sit down for a few days, and we share the information and plan what to do. And we tell them which part is a high hazard area, which part is safe, which part is not safe. And if you, if you receive a, a constant warning about the for the uh, uh, rainfall, then they know what to do. This is a very good example, and this is the one the new. Uh, and now we already have a manual. We have a uh, uh, EOT uh, manual for training or trainers to empower local community. Uh, I think this is the one a new. I think uh, progress in uh, in Malaysia, and uh, we know uh, early government uh, set. Uh, uh, a target uh, every year we should reach out 20,000 communities a year to uh, CBDRM program. This is a very positive moment, but it's very challenging for geologists for us to come up with very good hazard map, reliable, unquestionable. And that is a uh, technology coming future. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zakaria. I remember in one of the photos or, or slides presented by Dr. Zakaria, um, I think it was a session uh, together with um, uh, Dr. Rahayu uh, uh, and a uh, UNITAN team. 
to approach uh, community in Yan at that time, Dr. Rahayu. Yeah? Perhaps Dr. Rahayu can share some of uh, her experience as well eh? uh, later. Uh, good. I think we move to the next one. Um, well, we have a, a, a few uh, key people here. Um, we have a vice president here, and we have many uh, chairmen uh, of engineering geology uh, from Bangladesh, from Korea, uh, from Nepal. I, I wish uh, these sessions will also um, explore uh, some of the best practice. But I would like to quickly jump into the second phase, which is retrospective. Yeah? It's not just about the past, it's also about the future. Um, and I believe that one of the key points here is about technology and innovation. And uh, for this particular part, uh, I think let this first, um, let's, let's move to um, end. Uh, well, say the second point, Perhaps the audience wish to hear uh, some insight on the novel technologies. Uh, perhaps some of them have been presented uh, during your lecture. But given the fact that we have close to 50 uh, people online now, so, and 60% of them are from Rwanda, um, perhaps you can share uh, how this technology helps these disaster managers perhaps engineers, geologists, to make a right decision at the right time. That's one part. But second part, the most important issues on how basically you work with a different discriminatory, how you convey the message to the different field of peoples and experts, and how can we ensure their effective implementation based on the knowledge and evidence collected by the professionals practitioners and, and definitely uh, for your case as uh, prominent engineering geologists, how do you see these gaps and how do you filling up and how you think that technology of the future could fit in or at least bring in gaps um, given the complexity of the impact of climate change in the future? Wow, that's a huge question, <laughs> and there's a lot of pieces there. Um, look, I might start with um, perhaps the middle part of the section of the question um, around, um, you know, a real disaster, a real big problem for the country brings people together. Um, and um, one of the um, uh, really positive things about um, a disaster is that it causes collaboration, and we, um, in each case, uh, with uh, the Canterbury earthquakes, with the um, Kaikoura, and and now with um, the Cyclone Gabriel responses, um, we have brought together contractors, so those that can physically uh, respond, uh, consultants uh, across uh, multiple, normally competitive consultants, uh, acting together in teams. Um, with the contractor, with the uh, transport agency um, and um, Kiwi Rail uh, to respond to uh, some of those infrastructure challenges because uh, it, it's no use uh, responding to one little piece of, of the problem. This is a huge problem and we need to prioritise. Uh, we need to think about the whole of the system uh, and uh, we need to operate with the communities. We need to identify where they are um, and where the challenges are, and they know best actually um, what what's really critical for them. Uh, so in each of these cases, we have responded uh, by bringing these groups together. I suppose one of the things that is perhaps slightly disappointing that we haven't learned is, uh, you know, um, in the case of uh, the cyclone response, it is still taken. Uh, uh, about a year to form uh, a contract uh, that everyone's happy with uh, between the contractors, the consultants and, and the uh, owner. Um, so fortunately for New Zealand, uh, we have what are called network out to contracts, so maintenance contracts on the roadie network, and so those are made up of um, consultants and contractors working together, and they were able to respond uh, immediately uh, before um, 
while we wait for uh, everyone to work out their commercial um, uh, arrangements. But I guess then what I'm thinking is that we need to uh, set up these entities ahead of time, knowing that with climate change, we're going to see these problems more and more. So what is an effective commercial arrangement that we can deliver a response uh, would be one of my questions. Um, I showed you that in, uh, the photo with the um, power pylon on uh, because uh, we were concerned with a pylon located on a moving uh, landslide block that it, a man was going to go up the top to dislodge the wires, uh, which actually takes quite a bit of time and they swing down the wires. Uh, if the block continued to move or the pylon continued to move, he could lose his life. So. Um, what we did was install uh, remote instrumentation um, on the uh, legs of the pylon to determine uh, whether they were moving laterally or tilting, uh, tilt meters, uh, and everyone, the client and ourselves, uh, could monitor those on our phones uh, and determine uh, whether it was reasonably stable period for uh, a man to go up. Uh, so I thought that that's probably something that we could be doing all the time. Why are we inspecting all our pylons by physically having someone drive to site to give us lots of um, uh, you know, petrol and time? Uh, and it's much more efficient to install um, instruments and to be able to record um, what, what's going on around your network remotely. So that's just one example. Thank you, Anne. I, I think. Um... There's always a case where we learn from the tragedy and bounce back better. Um, and I'm uh, quite happy to hear the unlearned story as well you know, from the field. That's, that's how we improve our software and make it better uh, for the future. So moving right from um, uh, New Zealand, uh, perhaps um, uh, we had uh, some sign from Sanchiviram. Um, and talking about the technology and innovation, I think Japan is one of the leading countries. Um, but always, how what, what would be the best way to convey some of the policy makers that this technology helps? So perhaps Professor Chigura, if you can share uh, your views on how basically the modern and advanced technology helps the the field geologists, for example, and how this information is benefit uh, to the larger community, the field of engineering geology and geotechnical engineering. Please, Professor Chigera. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Kamaru. Uh, I'm sure that uh, there are many kinds of uh, new technologies, but uh, uh, just my idea. Uh, I'd like to share slide. Can you see? Yes. Okay. Okay. Now, novel technologies, so uh, innovation, transdisciplinary approaches for disaster resilience. Uh, I'd like to say this three. Uh, one is LIDAR, second is a GIS, and the third is a monitoring method. So, uh, LIDAR, uh, using a LIDAR, uh, we can detect precursory features of landslides. And uh, in addition, could be AI can help us to extract potential sites. A second GIS, or particularly free GIS, uh, not the so expensive ArcGIS, sorry. <laughs> and uh, using the GIS, we can use maps on a scale as we like, a wide area and the close up with small areas. And the third, monitoring uh, of our rainfall and the landslide movement and uh, using the monitoring data we can say uh, issue an alarm or uh, such information and uh, we can we can uh, develop the people's awareness and uh, or preparedness so uh, this is an example of the lidar so this is a huge rock avalanche in 2011 in Japan. When we apply LIDAR technique here, 
we can remove all trees and we can see the ground surface. And before this landslide, uh, along this rim of the landslide, already uh, small uh, displacement occurred. So uh, by using LIDAR, uh, I'm sure that we can predict uh, the potential size of a rock avalanche. However, uh, near the side, there are very similar features uh, like a small uh, cracks. And uh, these two seems very, say, unstable. So there are so many other scary slopes which actually did not fail. So we need to, say, evaluate uh, the uh, stability. So to do that, uh, I think AI could help us. Uh, second is the GIS. Uh, this is a uh, landslide by Noto Peninsula earthquake. This is a Noto Peninsula, 10 kilometers, and the red dots uh, indicate the locations of a uh, landslide. Uh, so, and the uh, colors uh, uh, geology maps. So, by using GIS, we can easily say investigate the relationship between landslides and and the geology or topography. So it's huge convenience to data analysis. As well as the data analysis, we can make a hazard map like this. This is a debris flow or hazard, uh, landslides and the slope failures. And uh, all over the Japan, this kind of uh, hazard maps uh, have been made. So GIS is uh, indispensable for hazard mapping and a platform for transdisciplinary approach. Now, this is awareness and alarming. This is a monitoring results of rainfall, rainfall, landslides, inundation, and flooding uh, by Japan Meteorological Agency. So this kind of uh, uh, monitoring and the data, uh, say, uh, pro, pro uh, data distributions uh, have been made. And uh, by using those data, uh, alarm uh, uh, last night, or uh, this is alarm have been issued by using a rainfall gauge and the radars, uh, they uh, rainfall, monitor rainfall, and uh, real time calculation of uh, groundwater by using this rainfall and issuing alarm. However, uh, this is uh, a uh, modeling of a uh, subsurface structure, but the geological conditions are the, uh, only one, and the, the difference are not considered. So this is a very sophisticated one, but uh, I need to say sophistication is not always uh, reliable. We cannot make countermeasures for all unstable slopes. Uh, that's uh, all, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Chigira. Uh, we are glad to see some of the uh, current or modern technologies being used uh, in the assessments from mapping to analysis and understanding better uh, some of the signature or clue behind these um, data uh, collected by the recent technology. Uh, well, I wish to give a floor to the audience. Uh, feel free uh, and um stand up and, and share with the audience if you have any particular questions this it's not a lecture session it's, it's a forum it's a dialogue and it wasn't really easy for the panelists to talk uh, for one and a half hours yeah? so um we perhaps uh, invite them yeah perhaps yeah uh secretaries if it helps <laughs> Oops. Maybe you can introduce yourself and question, yes. Uh, good evening. Well, I'm RL Sahu. I'm RL Sahu. I'm from an SPC representing India. So my uh, simple question to Miss Anne. Uh, regarding that liquefaction helps one that was very beautiful and uh, 
my question is like what was the magnitude of the earthquake that caused that lithium accident? And another point is what was the maximum depth at which you can find this seismically induced lithium accident features? Because in uh, in some of the literatures I have gone through, the, the maximum limit it was found that it is a, a snow lake in Alaska, it was 30 meter. Could you find any liquefaction features below that also? Because that is a point of research. Because at what depth there can you have this such kind of liquefaction features? Because for that thing, either plus below 30 meter depth, those uh, you have to have some uh, unconsolidated soil. Is it possible to have unconsolidated soil and that way in saturated conditions below 30 meter? So that is my question. Um, I think it is possible, but um, we haven't seen that. So I think the deepest was about 15 metres. In terms of, uh, I'm trying to remember your whole question. Uh, my another question was like, uh, what was the uh, Richter scale? Like, what was the magnitude of the earthquake? Yeah. So the first one was about 7.1. I'm a little bit rusty on that. And the subsequent ones are 6.8, 6.5, that order. So not really significant earthquakes in terms of magnitude. Okay, because the uh, liquefaction does also occur at the level of 4.6 also. I wanted to. Um, and I think the interesting thing about these earthquakes, uh, again, something that we hadn't understood before, was I kind of liken it to, you know, when you do a tennis serve, you kind of throw the ball up and then you whack it. Uh, and it was, of course, you're doing, uh, the earthquake is doing both of those things at, at once. Um, but they had very high vertical accelerations as well as horizontal. Um, which I think, you know, previously um, we've been doing studies rolling rocks down hillsides to see where they go, but with this vertical uh, element uh, at play as well, um, that meant that we were not uh, really accurate. Well, just one of my suggestions, because I have done some research uh, on this paleo seismology, it's on the new defining features, specifically on the liquefied induced uh, features, like sand boils and uh, little spread and all that thing. Uh, so, because normally it happens that whenever there is a liquefaction site, it keeps on happening. But sometimes it is so that okay, once it has happened, it will not happen within a uh, like maybe ten years or maybe hundred years because that uh, uh, soil gets densified. So, uh, like my point is, Karen, when I, you just uh, you can also uh, make some studies uh, regarding the paleo seismological aspects. So that would help you if you to revise like what are the sequences so that you know that data gap has to be filled up. Absolutely. So um, paleo seismic studies have been carried out. Um, I guess what the learning was, is we thought also that, you know, if, if you have liquefaction once, it's, it's going to be some time before it occurs again. But what we found that was that just kept occurring and of a similar magnitude. So the amount of silt that was produced is phenomenal. And that's it for me also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Seth, uh, for the question. Is that the interval, ma'am? Interval, oh, interval of still, uh, Just a few months. Just a few months. Two to three months. Okay. Does it happen? Because that soil gets. Earthquake, this magnitude maybe. I think, um, yeah, and you probably don't usually get so many of the similar magnitude earthquake in, over such a period. It's great. It's great. So I think going back to model, okay. I guess, yeah. So, Perhaps um, there are some more things to discuss to do in dinner, hopefully. Well, Prof. Brendan, I believe you have something. So please, the yeah, no. I'm just good on the topic right now. Uh, yeah, engineering, geology, and geotechnics for disaster risk reduction and community engineers. Intend to continue. So this is the thing like, uh, you know, whatever the case, uh, as Professor Chigira already mentioned, what uh, the, the preparation Japan already did for the uh, the community information or uh, the risks information. But the problem is that how you communicate to the people, that is very important. I I think uh, right now, uh, I, already, I was expecting from you, all of you are here, uh, Professor uh, Diagini from uh, Rwanda also here. Like my, my, my concern is that like how we can move for the this communication practice through the uh, engineering uh, participation of the engineering geologist and geotechnical engineer. That is a probably this is a big challenge that time like right now we are going to face. Because when you talk about the communication system, you have a, a warning. So then what? Who cares your warning? Because uh, we, we sorry to say that please don't believe community that they will listen to you. 
that is the one thing that you have to accept. You 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 cannot say that as a government you say something and then the, the people will listen you and then follow your all the instructions. So this is this point is really very critical right now. And I experienced from the last uh, 10 years in Nepali's case and also in other area. And I have been in Japan for a long time, so I saw the Japanese uh, announcement and how the people react and how they behave here. Okay. So the thing is that, like, how you communicate, how the engineering geologists and the technical engineers can support in this communication process. So this part is very critical, and I have to. I think we have to do some research on that one. So particularly, uh, what the lacking we are, uh, I, I, I'm guessing, or I, I saw in the in the whole process is that, like, let's say you have a communication process. First, you do the dialogue in, in some cases. Or sometimes you you have a dissemination dialogue and then participation. Participation. This is the mass communication process. And in whole process, where is the geology? Where is the engineering geology? Where is the geotech engineer? So this part is always lagging. And you all like what do we do? We give the whole responsibility to the our television anchor, our radio anchor, or our mobile center. That's it. So does it work? Yeah. So. That, that's the point that we have to elaborate, and I think we are eligible, or we are able to develop the, any kind of model. Uh, I don't have, I, I think, to the nature, uh, probably, although nature has so many restrictions, so many mystery, but whatever the case, we we are now able to do something in the in to understand the natural phenomena. But the thing is that whether you know something, but can you deliberate it particularly in the community? I, we don't, I don't think that community participation can help us for the uh, risk uh, and, and resilience process. Yeah, somehow it helps, but it doesn't work during the main event. So you have to be very careful on that one. So this is my, I don't know, where, where is the question in my comment, but I think uh, I'm able to write you the, raise you some, some very critical point where we have to be very, 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 very precise, actually. Yes, that's my, my, thank, my you. thank you, Professor. Thank you for your remarks and point. Uh, before we give a, a floor to uh, Professor Ghani, uh, perhaps a quick feedback from Dr. Zakaria, uh, addressing about well, engaging local communities, empowering them, and build them as, as a local champions. And something well, I think it was written uh, clearly in our moderation notes about risk communication. And, and perhaps that can share some of the Malaysian experience. Maybe we can also learn from Nepal. Uh, there's some the secrets, the recipe from Malaysia. So let's hear from Dato. Yeah, I think uh, your comments are very valid, Prof. Uh, but that depends on the culture and the, 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 the social fabric. For instance, our experience in uh, this year in uh, Mount Kinabalu, they have a good structure. We become the leaders, the leaders, especially at origins, uh, based on our social study. Whatever the leaders say, they follow. That's why we cut them, we, we sit down with them, then they have their followers together, we sit, and the engagement must be continuous. Not once after that, we win. I think if you use a gadget, I, it doesn't work. So this must be a personal touch. Uh, in fact, they are communicating with us almost every then and there. If the water, uh, the water, uh, the, uh, for instance, the river water raise up, they send the email that or uh, the, the, the text uh, that indicate they are very concerned about that. And the whole committee send the, uh, you know, the information to us. That indicate that the community is really uh, with us. I would say uh, that's one of the uh, depend on the local culture. So urban area is very different. Urban area, of course, or we are or, or migration, I would say. We are from outside, area very difficult. But we, we, we stay engaged with that groups. That's experience Yes, it's all about localizations uh, leaderships. Thank you, Dato. Um Annie, please. And I, I wish to hear a story from uh, Kigali. Uh, believe me, uh, this is also another uh, secret stuff uh, to be shared today, uh, Professor. Uh, 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 we have uh, one quick remarks from our audience. Okay, thank you very much. Actually, the Dr. has partly answered what I wanted to comment because after the Aceh earthquake and the tsunami uh, in Malaysia, if I say something wrong, you correct me. 
we have this system where the response, you know, the response plan was uh, initiated and what the local people like in Kada and Penang and Kodis, how they were supposed to do. So that time, I mean, it takes a disaster to put something like that in place. So maybe now after so many years, it has become a bit less, but I think it's still aware. The awareness is there. Similarly, uh, some time ago, uh, what in my opinion was maybe uh, uh, overhyped was the earthquake in Turkey. And then there was some sort of like, maybe like I said, maybe there's an overhyped sort of thing that something like that didn't happen in Malaysia until even I had to make some comment that, you know, Turkey and Malaysia, the tectonics is a bit different. But when you talk about tectonics, the average Malaysian thinks that there's something wrong with, with my head. I don't know. You know, they, they'll say you're crazy or something like that. But the, the point that I'm trying to make is uh, the local communities, uh, in my limited experience in this kind of thing, when they have faced a disaster, then they are very much more aware. It's the same thing in, in the Cameron Highlands, because in Cameron Highlands, I, I've experienced it with myself. You go and do field work there, and you say you are doing it for the government, they're very unhappy with you. But after there's a disaster, you go and say that you're doing this field work to sort of come up with some mitigation measures for the disaster, then they're not unhappy with you. So it's, it's the, like, like you mentioned, it's a culture and how the disaster that has happened shapes the subsequent response and the, how do I say, the preparedness to uh, listen and uh, receive uh, the measures or the, uh, yeah, the measures the, that are being uh, prepared by the authority. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your remarks. Um, well, definitely. Um, when I was uh, visited Gazantep, Hatay after a quick uh, last year, give me a huge understanding of the gaps in the world of the risk communication. Those who are investigations, assessments, mapping, understanding the phenomena, and those who are receiving the information. So who's supposed to be filling up these gaps, you know? Some of the geologists might be good in doing the work, but they might be not good in disseminating, communicating to the layman, you know, the, the language that they understand. There's always a case, but, but perhaps it's uh, something that we can learn from Kigali, from Rwanda. They have many secrets. <laughs> Professor Ligini, just share one of them, please. Thank you very much. Uh... What, what, what I want to say is that when we are starting a new project, uh, we have chance to learn from other mistakes. <laughs> so so the, if the early warning system is yet to be completed, we have chance to learn from other early warning system existing elsewhere in the world that, that we can take from lesson. And, uh, and uh, draw our own early warning system. That's why I say we can. In Rwanda, we are we have a project in pipeline. There is a pilot project we who use uh, uh, automatic photography, but there is a consistent way to solve this issue. First of all, before you. You design an early warning system, you need to have baseline studies from geological perspective, from geotechnical perspective, and around the country. This baseline is very cost, but it's needed. And the people who will do that baseline are scientists, are geologists, are geotechnicians. They will work under the request from the ministry in charge of uh, emergency and the landslide and any any situation that the be, can be generated by uh, that natural hazard. That's one. Two, after that baseline, we need to have a modeling system that can generate an early warning system. The slide I just share with you 
is what we call LEWS under studies with one of my PhD students. He, he discovered that we, we, we need at least four stages. One is the design. The second one is monitoring. The third one is forecasting. And the last is that education. And after this all, we communicate. <laughs> because one is design, geological knowledge, risk scenario, design criteria, charge, geo indicator, that is under the first component of design. Then we have the monitoring, instrument install, data collection, data transmission, data elaboration. It can be in different ways. It can be photography, it can be alarm, it can be sensor, but it needed to co be collected, elaborate, and transmitted. Then la the third one is forecasting. We need to have a data interpretation, a comparison of threshold, the forecasting method, and the warning. All the three need to be in a hydrogeomechanical model. Let's take an example for rainfall induced landslide. And these three components is one way to solve the issue. Then after we go to educated. We don't educated people not everything. We educate them on risk perception. We educate on safe behavior. We educate in a response to warning. And we educate population involvement. That is the way we think we will be able to respond. But before all this, a baseline study has to be done in different kind uh, of, of natural disaster that happen in Rwanda. Earthquake is one of them. Landslide is another one. Flood, sometimes induced landslide. But we have also volcanic eruption and methane gas outbreak from the lake Kivu monitoring. So in Rwanda, we have, we have uh, so many challenge in pipeline, but we think if we design it correctly with different partner, we can organize a very well system that involve the local population, the scientists in academia, the government institution, and be able to respond effectively to, to, to this and, and develop a very conductive early warning system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Digny. Um, I think we come to the last cycles. Um, uh, well, we have a couple of minutes to go. Uh, I know there are some questions uh, from the audience here, but we do have one question uh, from the uh, participants who are joining online from Rwanda, uh, from Wili. Um, well, let me quickly read this uh, greeting from Rwanda and Wili. Uh, considering the lesson learned globally, uh, disasters are clearly linked to geological and geotechnical function, as presented by our panelists. In our tech driven era, particularly with AI and early warning system, what innovative solutions should be brought to right to similarly integrate geological knowledge and geotechnical expertise for global <laughs> disaster resilience. How can we strategically leverage cutting edge technology to ensure maximum effectiveness worldwide? Wow. Uh, well, it's, the answer is not yes or no, definitely. Uh, and we have just a couple of minutes to go. I will give, well, always ladies first. <laughs> the, the difficult parts, always ladies. They, they can handle uh, nicely. Uh, but I think Professor Jikira can also uh, tell us uh, about the technology uh, clue uh, on the, uh, the geological knowledge and uh, geotechnical expertise. How are we filling up the gap with the inputs from uh, technology? And perhaps that too can give some clue on on the early warning system, people-centric early warning system. I think Professor Digini has 
mention a lot on, on the impact base uh, from design to the implementation. It has to be carefully co-designed with respective uh, knowledge from the geology, geotechnical engineering, and, and also local traditional and indigenous knowledge. So, and of course, yes. Thank you. Um, look, another very good question. I think uh, that there's an opportunity here, and we have the International Association for Engineering and Geology here, um, that we develop a, a working group internationally to bring um, this knowledge together and our thinking together. Um, we're all on a bit of a trajectory when it comes to AI um, and, you know, making different advances um, in different areas. Um, so combining that knowledge should help us to move faster. That would be one thing I want. I, I don't want to also be completely negative, but I, I want to say that, you know, there are some of the really basic things that we need to do well and to do them and continue to do them. And that's recording um, our observations and bringing them together in a standardized way. I think that way, if we, if we have a way that we all record, we can share data very much more easily and then we can use it to um, go to uh, calibrate machine learning because you need really good data to calibrate uh, machine learning. Um, the other thing I would like to say, and it's probably stepping back and sorry off your question slightly, is that, uh, you know, the memory of people is, is short. Um, and, you know, the earthquakes in Canterbury, they occurred now 13 years ago. Um, you can still see some of the uh, unresolved uh, sites in the city, and yet people have put it behind them and moved on and in their minds. The next earthquake's uh, not in their lifetime, and so the behaviours are not uh, taking these things on board. Uh, one final thing is, uh, you know, there are so many, uh, certainly in my country, and I'm sure in Nepal, and I'm sure actually in Malaysia, there's so many narrow roads and so forth with, that are all susceptible to uh, landsliding. And we see some, and, you know, the beginnings of movement. We identify sites that need to be repaired. But how can we afford to repair all of those uh, networks? So how are we going to prioritise and, and put our money where, where it needs to be? Um, for, Good, good. Thank you. And um, Professor Chigira, you have some additional remarks to add on, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, I would say in the last slide I showed you before, uh, a hazard mapping have been made in Japan all over, mostly all over Japan, but uh, uh, they are say based on the topography rather than the geological features however huge numbers of engineering geologists uh, have been uh, working to to make such as, as, as a map so there is a gap uh, geologists have uh, say tendency to to say like a very detailed and very various properties but uh, to make uh, has a mapping, has a map or something like that, we need to simplify uh, the geology and uh, other factors. So that's kind of a gap, but uh, that's an important thing we need to overcome. Say, that's just a uh, hazard map I showed you before, and also a alarming system based on a rainfall monitoring. As I mentioned, the ground uh, the structure of the subsurface is only one to make uh, that system. But uh, as a geologist, uh, that's not true. <laughs> many, many various uh, structures. But we need to we need to find, uh, say, how uh, how to say simple simple model, and uh, we need to we need to improve uh, such a system. Not, not. Uh, yeah, we need to cooperate and uh, improve <laughs> such a system. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and and that was a comment. A question for me. Uh, this is based on my experience in Bolivar, uh, Young Dam, Bolivar. We set up a a global global one system. Uh, hobby design, yeah. but then uh, when it come to the uh, construction. We uh, let the local community participate in that. Uh, first thing, uh, putting cabling uh, beside, 
we have to put the uh, protection and so on. So the sex belonging. Then that's on not only that, uh, after that, uh, I think now it's uh, 30 second years. Uh, we have a series of engagement, maintenance, and so on. So I think with that, uh, the community is part of the uh, design and also implementation and uh, construction and so on. So you feel that the uh, early warning system belongs to them, for them. And that is uh, one of the way I think, uh, uh, you know, for this group of people, uh, it's so happened that you have local champion who really active during the disaster. So we beat that, that guy. We know uh, based on the story we survey, few of them like this and uh, there are local people that they are very active during the disaster, helping people. So we beat that uh, uh, people as a leader. I mean, locally, the picking of our local leaders is a very crucial so in, in the for this uh, uh, system uh, implementation and Thank you. Um, yes, um, Dr. Rahayu, someone, please. Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, because I, uh, in this discussion, most of the, um, is, uh, the panel discussed based on the um, structural mitigation. I would like to ask how about non-mitigation uh, structure like uh, insurance for community? Uh, because uh, it's one of um, issues actually. And then it's, uh, I think it's important uh, for community to have uh, insurance community. Yes, it's a, a good and valid question. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rahayu, uh, for bringing into the discussion. Well, basically, we really, really have much more time to complete the session. I'm not sure whether we have some best practice from New Zealand about the risk transfer on the insurance. Perhaps they engage a geologist to and uh, one very quick, but I do believe uh, we have some uh, initiative in, in Japan um, incorporating uh, the local knowledge uh, into this uh, risk transfer program. And I think early warning system is one of the non-structural measures, uh, but I think the, the insurance space require sufficient information. So perhaps geology, um, informations could also lead to some of the better decisions into what type and which um, mechanism should be in the designs of the risk transfer like uh, insurance. I'm not sure and you have something to share? Yeah, yes, please. Um, interesting question. Um, so in New Zealand, we have an unusual system. It's called the EQC, the Earthquake Commission. Uh, and so if you have any level of insurance on your property, um, the EQC will pay out in the event of a natural disaster. Uh, and so in New Zealand, there is over 80% of people are insured for uh, a natural disaster effectively. Um, although uh, there is, you know, what they actually pay out is, is uh, another question. But uh, so that's interesting. Um, I guess you're more wondering how we can inform uh, the insurance price because, um, you know, insurers have not been doing too well um, in recent years with natural disasters. Um, and uh, I know um, this is just an example, but a program in, in Canterbury, um, there had been practice uh, up until that point uh, where um, structural engineers were sometimes macerating as geotechs. Um, and so there was few uh, investigations because people felt the geological profile wasn't too variable. Um, since that time, uh, there has been a requirement for at least one investigation borehole on every site that is developed, um, and that is to provide the insurers with some additional information on which to make uh, some of their insurance judgments. Just a, a small example. Okay, thank you. And uh, I think we come to the end. Um, 
not sure whether there are still burning questions from the audience here in the hall or uh, online. No, I think it's perfect. Um, it's a 500 my time, Malaysian time. We have promised 10 key recommendations. Let's pop up on the screen and share with the audience online. Um, some of them are policy makers, disaster managers, professional engineers, professional geologists. Let's have a look together. Um, it's still a draft. We will circulate and to get more inputs from the audience physically and virtually. I think it's coming soon. Yes. Uh, that's wrong. That's wrong. One. We did on purpose. We want to sell our product, our program. It's by designs, yeah. Yeah. Well, for those who are interested with the masters of disaster risk management, please do contact us. Yes, ten key recommendations. Uh, believe me, this one of the most remarkable groups who are working behind the scene. They went to your sessions, consult uh, during dinner. They don't care about the foods. They just think of their recommendation last night. So let's present. So the first part, if you look into these international knowledge sharing platforms, I think Professor Ranjan did mention about the, the, the knowledge, the data learning from the field, and also and did mention about uh, field is the key. Uh, we have to go into the field and, and, and uh, observe more. Number two, uh, we put on the inter-transdisciplinary partnerships. I think that Zakaria did uh, express a concern on how one particular field and, and how basically they can communicate with other uh, stakeholders. Professor Ghani did mention about the risk communication. I think this multi uh, inter-transdisciplinary partnership is one of the way forward. Uh, third on mainstreaming this disaster risk reduction agenda and climate change adaptation is about six years to go to Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, SDG, and many more global agenda. We are talking about 2030 agenda and post 2030. So we need that, uh, say, national, regional, national, and, 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 and state and local level uh, types of strategies and action. Uh, definitely, engineering geology and geotechnical engineering practices is a, have a bigger clues into this equation. Number four, I think this is one of the remarkable uh, points uh, from uh, young geologists, young professional engineers, look into this increased funding and support. So it's not just about traveling to Nepal, traveling to Bangladesh next year to attend the conference, but also a small grant solving unsolved problems. They need funding. They need to explore and going to the field and collect more data. I think we keep on talking about these mechanisms, financial mechanisms, not only IAAG, SEGRM, there are also other uh, professional association here. Number five, on the uh, multi-skill uh, collaborations um, across sectors, public, private, academia, but don't forget governmental and non-governmental organization, civil society organization. So to integrate this engineering geology expertise into the community-based disaster risk management initiative, I think that Zakaria has mentioned a few uh, points and Professor Digni has shared the say uh, secrets on how we can co-design, co-develop uh, four major teams and integrate into this uh, major pipeline on the uh, impact base of people-centric early warning systems. And the words of empowering local communities, I think we had discussed about that next. And number six, until 10, I'm not going to reach one by one, but number six is about cutting edge technology. I still remember 10 years ago when we bring the technology, LIDAR technology, it worth for 50 million ringgit Malaysia for 1,500 square kilometer. But nowadays, you can have double, triples than with such budget. So we need to explore even more 
modern technology, uh, particularly remote sensing, GIS. And Professor Chikira did mention about open source GIS. Yes. Well, there are many open source society uh, making open the data. Uh, so the decisions was also make uh, uh, transparency uh, uh, through this and artificial intelligence AI has been discussed. Uh, keep in mind about the last words, number six, inform decision making. I think that's one of the most important part. Uh, and it's not just about accurate information, but also very timely. Number seven, about establishment of regional task force or specialized working groups. We had a, a quick discussion about that, and we have a vice president here. Both, um, please have a look, and this one of the resolutions from Kuala Lumpur um, uh, and, and consider these uh, diverse and region specific geo hazard challenges. And number eight, evocation advocates for the inclusions of the engineering geology and geo geotechnic in, in national and regional policy frameworks. It's, it's not just about making developing a policy recommendation and intervention, but how important to translate those into action. And, and uh, it does mention about the critical infrastructures, urban planning, and, and local disaster risk reduction and gender. Number nine, support initiative that promote gender equity um, and diversity. Unfortunately, we have to end on, on the stage, but perhaps we need to invite more panelists more members, more uh, gender balance um, in the association. So I, I hope that the message here uh, has been tran uh, transmitted uh, through the uh, president's, the speech by the president of IAG on the first day. But uh, the key words, uh, number nine, the second part, mentorships programs. I think in, in Japan, we do have this Kohai Senpai you know, a senior and junior, uh, I think let's explore and keep in mind these uh, scholarships, fellowships, uh, give a good, uh, say, uh, a budget and priority to the female representations. And number 10, um, lucky or not, um, IAG, SEGRM have to evolve. Uh, there are many more international and regional organizations at the moment. One of them is the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, who so, uh, are basically oversee the uh, Sendai Monitor, uh, particularly dealing with the uh, disaster risk reduction and resilience, and not to mention these uh, international positions on geo disaster reduction. So Dr. Zakaria, in fact, um, two weeks ago, uh, three weeks ago, they have launched a national association for geo disaster and 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 um, community resilience bit. That's that's it for today. That's what was written in my contract. Um, supposed to finish last two minutes. Um, so ten key recommendation has been presented and delivered. Let's join me to give a big uh, hand to our panelists. And uh, to Professor Chigira, Professor Digne, believe me, these four panelists, they can talk um, hours. Um, you can just name it whatever questions, uh, but this ladies first, yeah? So there's always, um, uh, we look into the complexity of the questions and understanding the process, but most important part, learning from the past so that we can make a better uh, uh, decisions in the near future. So as a moderator today, we would like to apologize any hiccups, any inconvenience, and I'm happy to end the sessions. Thank you very much for your attentions. I hand over again to uh, Mr. Paro. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. This again, give a round of applause for our lines of speakers. Kamarol, uh, and Williams, and to Zakaria, uh, Professor Chigira, and uh, Professor Digme. So I would like to invite every all the moderator and the panelists uh, uh, to the seat. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, as we draw near to our uh, the end of our conference, uh, it's time to reflect on the incredible journey we had together by watching. Uh, oh, haven't passed yet. Oh, please. So we have prepared uh, some amateurish video. Yeah. 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 Y